Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about membrane structure and function. Now, our cells are defined by a plasma membrane that surrounds the contents of said cell and it serves as a barrier or boundary. That plasma membrane is the edge of life, the boundary that separates the living cell from its surroundings in addition to controlling traffic into and out of the cell it surrounds. Like all biological membranes, the plasma membrane exhibits selective permeability. That is, it's only going to allow some substances to cross more easily than others. And the ability of the cell to discriminate in its chemical exchange with its environment is really fundamental to life. And it's the plasma membrane and its component molecules that make selectivity possible. So, in this chapter, we're going to learn how cell membranes control the passage of substances. And to understand how membranes work, we're going to begin by examining their structure. Then in the rest of the chapter, we're going to describe in some detail how plasma membranes control transport into and out of the cell, sometimes through proteins like ion channels um, or other transmembrane proteins, all right? Now, specifically, we're going to work through the following objectives, all right? One, we're going to discuss and understand how cellular membrane membranes are fluid mosaics of lipids and membranes. And then we're going to move into discussing the membrane structure and how it results in selective permeability. Then we'll learn about passive transport and how passive transport is diffusion of a substance across a membrane with no energy investment. With passive transport out of the way, we can move into active transport. Active transport uses energy to move solutes against their gradient. And last but not least, we'll talk about bulk transport across the plasma membrane that can occur through exocytosis or endocytosis. All right, and that's going to make up the contents of this chapter. So let's go ahead and let's get started. There is so much to learn about membranes. Here you see a figure, and we're really going to break this down. We're going to understand all the sort of um, um, chemistry and biology that goes into um, structure and functions of membranes. All right, now let's do our first objective let's learn about our first objective which is that cellular membranes are fluid mosaics of lipids and membranes lipids and proteins these are stable ingredients of membranes and although carbohydrates are also important it is lipids and proteins that are the main components now the most abundant lipids in most membranes are phospholipids and the ability of phospholipids to form membranes is pretty much inherent in their structure we covered this last time in our general scope of the four classes um, where we discuss lipids proteins carbohydrates and nucleic acids um, when we focused on lipids we we, we we discussed the structure of phospholipids and how they have um, both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. You know, part of the lipid likes water, part of the lipid does not like water. And so the ability of phospholipids to form membranes is pretty much inherent in their molecular structure because the, the, the hydrophilic uh, parts are going to form the, the exterior and the, hydrophilic part, uh, the hydrophobic tails are going to form in the interior. Right, because if you're going to form a plasma membrane, that's a bilayer. All right, you're going to have one kind of like layer of phospholipids and another bottom layer to form that bilayer. All right, and so here's your lipid structure. We're going to just highlight one right here. Right, you have um, this red circle. This red circle is your hydrophilic head, and then you have in purple your hydrophobic tails. Now it makes sense that. If you're forming a plasma membrane, then it is the kind of exterior here, um, the inner and outer portions here that are going to be the hydrophilic heads. They're going to interact with water, and so you want the water-loving portion to be interacting with water, whereas the hydrophobic portion is here in the interior. The tails, as you as you see, um, they are they make up the interior of the phospholipid bilayer. All right, now. 
other types of membrane lipids um can also have this 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 ampiothetic property but a phospholipid bilayer bilayer right since we're on that topic can can exist as a stable boundary between two aqueous environments or compartments because the molecular arrangement of this phospholipid bilayer like we just talked about um it, it's arranged to shelter the hydrophobic tails from water while exposing the hydrophilic heads to water all right and so it's 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 constructed in a way right that exposes these all these hydrophilic heads of lipids to water to aqueous environments and it shelters all these hydrophobic parts in the interior of that phospholipid bilayer so it doesn't have to interact with water now like membrane lipids most membrane proteins also have a similar property where they have you know some portions of hydrophilic um, um, parts and hydrophobic parts they're they're ampi uh, I'm gonna spell that because I always feel like I butcher it ampi Perfect. All right. Now, such proteins are going to reside in this phospholipid uh, bilayer um, with their hydrophilic regions protruding out. So, for example, let's look at this protein right here. All right. Notice how this protein, it's embedded in the phospholipid bilayer the portion of it that's going to that's going to come out of this phospholipid layer is are going to be the hydrophilic region so that they you know there's there's no repulsion in the interaction with water in in either environments um this molecular orientation is going to maximize contact of the hydrophilic regions of proteins with water in the cytosol and in the extracellular fluid while providing the hydrophobic parts of the uh, of the protein in non aqueous environments. So what we notice here are is that things are arranged in a way that that benefits um, the the chemistry uh, of the of the molecule of, of the structure that we're investigating. Notice how our lipids when they form um, by uh, phospholipid bilayers, how they're orienting themselves so that the favorable the 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 hydrophilic heads interact with things that are very favorable favorable to them and the hydrophobic parts are sheltered to, uh, sheltered from that and notice how it's the same for the proteins that are embedded in this bilayer the hydrophilic parts extrude out of the phospholipid bilayer and interact with the cytosol and the extracellular matrix whereas the portion of the protein that's hydrophobic is here in the middle along with the hydrophobic tails of the lipids so that it doesn't have to interact um and, and in this construction of the phospholipid bilayer, we call this model the fluid mosaic model. The membrane is a mosaic of protein molecules that are bobbing in this fluid bilayer of phospholipids. Now, the proteins, they're not randomly distributed, although this the images like this may, may seem um, um, seem that way, but they're not. The proteins are not randomly distributed in the membrane. Groups of protein are are often associated in long-lasting specialized patches where they carry out common functions. The lipids themselves also appear to form defined regions as well. And in some regions, the membranes may be much more packed with proteins. And like with all models, the fluid mosaic model is continually being refined as new research is, reveals more about the membrane structure the dynamics of of lipids and lipid membranes is is um something that's continuously being worked on and and new research is always evolving now on this point of fluidity right we said that the fluid mosaic model describes how um the membrane it's a mosaic of protein molecules that are bobbing in this fluid bilayer of phospholipids. On that point of fluidity, membranes, they're not static sheets of molecules. All right, they're not just, this is just not locked in some form of rigidity. All right, but instead a membrane is held together by primarily by hydrophobic interactions, which are much weaker than covalent bonds. Most of the lipids and then some of the proteins 
because of that can shift about laterally. That is the plane of the membrane. Um, like it's, it's kind of like, um, party goers elbowing their way through a crowded room. All right. So it can, it can move laterally these sheets so there, there's a fluidity to this phospholipid bilayer it's not rigid not rigid like in the sense of how you would think of a cell wall is all right these plasma membranes are fluid they can shift laterally um you have regions where um certain proteins will be packed more that are specialized in certain functions um and in some regions where the lipids pack those proteins more tightly so the fluid mosaic model very much captures the essence of that now very rarely also a lipid may flip flop across the membrane switching from one phospholipid to the other this the lateral movement of phospholipids within the membrane is is very rapid now, on this topic, we can also talk about factors that are going to affect membrane fluidity, right? They're, it's, a, it's captured by the fluid mosaic model, but how do other factors affect the membrane fluidity is a very important question that we want to answer. Well, a membrane is going to remain fluid as temperature decreases until the phospholipids settle into a very closely packed arrangement and the membrane solidifies. So as you bring, as you crank that temperature down, you could reach some form of, uh, of rigidity. It's kind of like how bacon grease forms lard when it, when it cools. The temperature, the temperature at which the, the membrane solidifies kind of depends on the types of lipids it's made out of, right? The membrane is going to re remain fluid to a lower temperature if it's really rich in phospholipids with unsaturated hydrocarbon tails. Um, because of the kinks in the tails where double bonds are located, unsaturated hydrocarbon tails cannot pack together as closely as saturated hydrocarbons, um, making the membrane more fluid. And so kind of to, to summarize a couple of points, all right, most of the lipids and some of the proteins can drift laterally. Lateral movements of the phospholipids is rapid, and you can see here, lateral movement, um, 10 to the 7 times per second, very fast, very rapid. All right, lateral movement of proteins is slow. Now, you can have some flip-flopping of phospholipids, but that's very rare, right? That's where, like, two lipids switch their position. Um, fluidity is enhanced by unsaturated hydrocarbon tails of phospholipids. All right. So notice how unsaturated hydrocarbon tails, right? Whenever you have a double bond, it causes kinks in your tails, which makes it more fluid. Whereas if you have saturated hydrocarbon tails, they pack more tightly. Um, the membrane's a little bit more viscous, if you will. All right. Now, in addition, cholesterol molecules, all right, you can also have cholesterol molecules embedded in this membrane. Uh, what they do is they reduce fluidity, but they help prevent solidification at low temperatures. Why? Because they kind of prevent tight packing of phospholipids. They're like things that embed in the middle of, of, of this plasma membrane and, and prevent from total tight packing of the phospholipids which helps when you reduce temperature the the membrane won't solidify as quickly all right fantastic so that's how factors affect membrane fluidity something else that's important or, or another important question that was posed when studying membranes was um, um do membrane proteins move and so there was an experiment carried out by dr frey and dr editon of johns hopkins they carried out um, this 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 experiment where they labeled the plasma membrane proteins of a mouse cell. All right, so they have a mouse cell. They um, labeled the membrane proteins, and then they took a human cell. They did the same thing. They they labeled the membrane proteins. All right. They labeled the plasma membrane proteins of a mouse cell and a human cell, but they did it with two different markers. All right, and then they fused the cells. All right, so now you have this hybrid cell. All right, and then they used a microscope and they observed the markers of this hybrid cell. And what they noticed in conclusion is that the mixing of the mouse and human membrane proteins indicate that at least some membrane proteins are going to move sideways 
within the plane of the plasma membrane. All right. And that is really cool. And it helps us transition onto a topic of more specific, uh, more specifically types of membrane proteins. There are really two major populations of membrane proteins. You have integral proteins and you have peripheral proteins. So integral proteins, they penetrate the hydrophobic interior of the lipid bilayer. And the majority, uh, the majority are transmembrane proteins, which are going to span that membrane. Um, and some other and other integral proteins can also just extend only partway into the hydrophobic interior. All right. So in integral proteins, they penetrate the hydrophobic interior of the lipid bilayer, and sometimes they span um, the whole membrane. Sometimes not. You also have peripheral proteins. These are not embedded in the lipid bilayer at all, but they're kind of like appendages that are loosely bound to the surface of the membrane. All right. And so they're often um, exposed part of the integral protein. All right. Now, a single cell may have many different kinds of membrane proteins on the cell that carry out several different functions, such as transport through the cell membrane, enzymatic activity, or attaching a cell to either a neighboring cell or the extracellular matrix. There are many functions of membrane proteins. And actually, let's go over a couple because it's really important. So six major functions of membrane proteins. We're going to go over these six First one is transport. A protein that spans the membrane, like you see here, look how that spans the membrane. This is the phospholipid bilayer. All right. A protein that spans the membrane may provide a hydrophilic channel across the membrane that is selective for a particular solute. All right. So a, a membrane protein can serve as a transport for hydrophilic solutes, right? Because yes, your exteriors here, this is a hydrophilic head, that's a hydrophilic head, but the interior are hydrophobic tails. So some hydrophilic solutes may have trouble passing the plasma membrane themselves, right? And so things like membrane proteins can help in facilitating that movement across the membrane. Another major function of membrane proteins is enzymatic activity. All right, a protein built into the membrane may be an, eye, uh, an enzyme with its active site exposed to substances in the adjacent solution. All right, and so again, membrane proteins can serve as enzymes where you can have molecules that will um, attach themselves to the active site of that enzyme. All right. Uh, membrane proteins can also participate in signal transduction. A membrane protein may have a binding site with a specific shape um, that fits the shape of a chemical messenger, like a hormone. And this external messenger or signal may cause a conformational change in the protein that relays the message to the inside of the cell. All right, membrane proteins can also participate in cell-to-cell -cell recognition or intracellular joining. Um, here, membrane proteins of adjacent cells may hook together in various kinds of junctions. All right, and last but not least, um, membrane proteins can participate in attachment to the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. All right, so these are the six major functions of membrane proteins. Fantastic. Well, then let's move into our second objective now. Membrane structure results in selective permeability. Now, the biological membrane, it's, it's an exquisite example of supramolecular structure where you have these many molecules that are ordered into some higher level of organization. And because of that, it has emergent properties beyond those of the individual molecules themselves. So what that means is when you organize many, many molecules together in some higher level of organizations, they can participate in functions that are greater than the, that single molecule unit can. can. All right. The, re the remainder of this chapter is really going to focus on one of those properties that um, molecules 
ordered into higher level of organization can participate in. And that is the ability to regulate transport across cellular boundaries. This is a function that is so essential to the cell's existence because what the cell allows in and out of, of, of its compartment is going to have a direct consequence to the cell's viability. All right. Now, we're going to see through the rest of this chapter how form fits function, right? The fluid mosaic model really helps explain how membranes regulate the cell's molecular traffic. It helps us visualize that there's a steady traffic of small molecules and ions that move across the plasma membrane in both directions. And the cell, the cell is able to take up some small molecules and ions and exclude others. First thing we want to cover here in this particular objective, um, actually there's two things that, that we want to discuss when we discuss membrane structure that results in selective permeability. We want to talk about specifically the permeability of the lipid bilayer and the role of transport proteins in that. And so first for this first point, the permeability of the lipid bilayer. Now, Non-polar molecules, things like hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, oxygen, they are hydrophobic. What that means is they can therefore dissolve into the lipid bilayer of the membrane and cross it easily without the aid of membrane proteins. All right. The problem is that this hydrophobic interior of the membrane Im impedes direct passage of polar molecules. Polar molecules are hydrophobic, uh, I'm sorry, are hydrophilic, right? Polar molecules, unlike non-polar molecules, are hydrophilic, right? So let's, let's write that. Non-polar molecules tend to be hydrophobic, all right? Polar molecules tend to be hydrophilic. Non-polar molecules have an easy time crossing the membrane. Polar molecules, on the other hand, they have difficulties passing the membrane, or they may pass very slowly. All right, so things like water. Water is a polar molecule. It does not cross rapidly. A charged atom or molecule and its surrounding shell of water are even less likely to penetrate the hydrophobic interior of the membrane. All right. And so the lipid bilayer is only one aspect of the gatekeeper system that's responsible for a cell's selective permeability. In addition to that, which helps us um, transition into the role of transport proteins, proteins that are built into the membrane can help also play a role in what crosses, right? So the, the, the very essence of the lipid bilayer plays a role in what crosses and what doesn't because obviously with its hydrophobic interior it's going to it's going to obviously prefer it's obviously going to make it easier for hydrophobic nonpolar molecules to cross and polar molecules to have a much more difficult time all right so that's one thing that affects um what crosses and what doesn't just the natural permeability of the lipid bilayer Another thing that affects what crosses and what doesn't is the transport proteins that are embedded in the lipid membrane itself. Specific ions in a variety of polar molecules, they can't move through the cell membrane on their own, but these hydrophilic substances can avoid contact with the lipid bilayer by instead passing through transport proteins that span the membrane. Some transport proteins called channel proteins, they function by having a hydrophilic channel so that certain molecules or atomic ions can use that tunnel um, and, and, and pass through the membrane. For example, the passage of water molecules through the membrane, it happens with the help of a channel protein called aquaporins. They are, are, are protein channels that specifically help water cross the, the lipid membrane bilayer without interacting with the hydrophobic region. All right, so membrane structure results in select, selective permeability. We see how the natural permeability of the lipid um, bilayer, how it affects what crosses and what doesn't, and how transport proteins can help certain other molecules pass that lipid bilayer as well. Fantastic. 
Now we're going to stop here. Next time we're going to talk about passive and active transport as well as bulk transport. I hope this was helpful so far. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.